pretty interesting. These two guys met uh, studying at Harvard. Uh, so they had a convergence of, I don't think, Bob, you had, didn't really have any security background at the time, did you? Or oh, just some classes. Classes and stuff, it, yeah. right. And then Ryan, you know, being the information security person, they came together and uh, collaborated on this talk. So I, I think it's going to be really good. I'm looking forward to hear it. So give them a warm round of applause. Welcome, Ryan. Hello. 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 Do I turn this on? Hello. 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 Oh, there it is. Stand up! <laughs> that, was, that was uncalled for. It's going to be difficult if I was here, huh? <laughs> Good afternoon. So uh, we're going to talk about analytics in information security. So uh, first, let me get through the introductions first. So my name is Ryan, and as uh, Jason said, uh, Rob is there. Rob will give his uh, more thorough introduction when uh, his talks come in. But for me, yeah, I'm Ryan Dalabis. I'm from Security NA, and I've uh, pretty much, I guess, talked in every single ShakaCon ever. <laughs> Even the one in, uh, I think that was in Pagoda, right, or something. So yeah. Yeah, the very first one. So it's really nice to see some old faces here. I see like old school Shaka Khan shirts and all of that stuff. And I'm really happy that to see new faces as well. So thank you very much for coming to Shaka Khan. So back to me. So what's new with me? So shameless plug. So, so several, several, several months ago, uh, I released a book with my co-author and uh, host of ShakaCon, Mr. Jason Martin. Yep, so it's, it's, a, it, it's doing okay, meaning my mom, my dad, my, my friends. Yeah, it, it, yeah but honestly, it, it's, doing, it's doing okay, but it's not going to be the next Harry Potter or anything like that. So anyway, I mentioned the book because this talk is actually based on a new book that we are working right now with Bob, same publisher, uh, Singress. So it's called Information Security Analytics, Finding Insights, Patterns, and Anomalies. So this talk is actually an excerpt of uh, two of the chapters. One is about simulations, and one is about uh, big data. And uh, Bob will be talking about big data, very trendy and very, uh, uh, what do you call that? A trendy topic. And uh, simulations is not as trendy and not as popular, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. So I'm going to talk about simulations. So let's talk about simulations. So basically, simulations are, simply put, uh, computer games that reflect or imitate a real life scenario. So for example, you have an assembly line. So you have a simulation of an assembly line here. So it's simple as that. So why do we do simulations? So simulations are for two things, optimization and analysis. For first one, optimization, basically what we need to do there is like find the best possible solution for a certain problem or scenario. So for analysis, what we do there is like what ifs. So what if we do this? What if we do that? So what are the results of each of those scenarios? So basically optimization, Analysis, that's all you need to think about to why we're using simulations. So who uses simulations? So it's very, it has, simulations is in very high demand, like medicine, military, operations management, like for example here, here's a simulation of a helicopter combat mission. Like me, myself, like I got started in simulations doing like medical informatics, like uh, putting layouts of emergency rooms and all of that kind of stuff. So that's how I got into this kind of thing. So it's not, in, uh, not too popular in information security, unfortunately, but I think it can be used. And I think it's uh, something that all of us should try touching, like, uh, like uh, try trying as well. So anyway, so what I think uh, uh, simulations can be used for in security is because 
we have a lot of security data. And with a lot of security data, it's possible to forecast possible results and scenarios. I'll deal more with this with my examples a little bit later. So knowing by forecasting possible results and scenarios, we can define security policies, make decisions, and all of that kind of stuff. So now we know what the basic idea of a simulation is. So that's a simulation. Let's go now to the more nitty gritty stuff. So there's two modeling paradigms for simulations. So think of it as types, so types of simulations. We have discrete event simulation, commonly called as DES, and system dynamics. Let's talk first about system dynamics. So system dynamics, think of system dynamics as just an equation, an equation that reflects a system or a system change. But we're not going to talk about simulations because, I mean, we are going to talk about simulations. I'm talking about it right now. So, but we're not going to talk about system dynamics because uh, it has a lot of math and we have equations and we didn't come here for that, right? So anyway, so, but one thing that, uh, that should take a look here is this is actually like a very popular equation of the simulation of the hunter and prey simulations. You've probably seen that. Like a, look it up in Google, you'll find it. There's a lot of simulations like that, like hunter, prey kind of thing. So, so that's basically like a system dynamics. But we're not going to talk about system dynamics. We're going to talk about the other one, the discrete event simulation. So in my opinion, like a DES or discrete event simulation is by far the easiest to model in terms of simulations. And I think it's more of a match, like real life scenarios. And the thing here that you need to think about in discrete event simulations is these, modeled as decree, uh, discrete entities. So you're probably wondering what are discrete entities. So has anyone like played here like Sims? The Sims, Simpsons, Sims. So basically Sims, when you're, when, uh, so in like the Sims, so for example, this is a shopping mall, those discrete entities are actually like the people. So in that combat scenario that I showed you, the discrete entities are actually the, like the helicopters and stuff. So let's say you have like a thousand people in a shopping mall, you're recreating a thousand different entities, a thousand different objects. So that's discrete event simulations. Not only is it like, uh, like easier to work with, it's like, well, prettier than an equation. So, Aside from that, like a discrete event simulations, it's yeah, fairly easy, uh, fairly uh, has some advantages. Like for example, it's easy to put like logic rules. We'll talk about logic rules later when we get into uh, some of the examples that I'll show you. Then it's also very easy to visualize. You actually see it. You see the simulation happening, not compared to like an equation, right? You just see like a graph and stuff. It's very easy to interpret. And, for me, what I really like about it, it has many user-friendly software available. So in this particular presentation, we're going to uh, be seeing Arena. So it's a pretty nifty simulation software. There's also some, uh, excuse me, some other software like Mad Model Simulate, and there's also like some other open source stuff like uh, NetLogo and stuff like that. But for now, we're going to show you Arena. So. So you can see here, Arena, one thing that I need to tell you is Arena is unfortunately not open source, but it does have a student edition which comes for free. And it uh, pretty much has like all the, all the uh, bells and whistles of a pro edition, though it can't handle a lot of like discrete entities. So this is what Arena looks like, so uh, kind of like visual, huh? So, Okay, simulation with Arena. So what I like about Arena is it's very flexible and customizable. You can like specify entities and you can like visualize everything. You'll see like entities going around. You see what's actually happening in the simulation. And what's also neat about it is you can find like a, like a lot of statistics and report functions in Arena. So you'll see like what's happening. You'll get an idea what all this is about when I show you the examples a little bit later. So, and what's neat about this is like no coding required. You can code, you can use Simon and uh, VBA, but for all intents and purposes, you can, if you know how to use Visio, 
you can use Arena. So it's very, very, very visual-like. So, so finally, like my uh, uh, last part of the talk, will be talk I'll be talking about like simulation examples using Arena. So the thing here is like I can't really, like unfortunately I can't like uh, uh, show you cre like some creating a simulation from scratch in 10 minutes. But uh, the thing here is like uh, since after this is a break, I can uh, you can like just grab me there, and uh, we can do like a mini workshop or something if you want actually want to like uh, create simulations. It's very simple. I can teach it like really fast, but very simple stuff. Not the type of things that I will be showing here. And besides that, like uh, you can also download stuff like uh, like all my like uh, visual I mean, my simulation examples are here, and I also have like. Uh, a copy of Arena here, so please don't download. It's kind of large, and I know the Wi-Fi might be like kind of swamped and stuff. So, but I have it here, and don't worry, this is not a pen test. I won't social engineer you. So, so I have it all here. So let's go through like the simulation examples. Now I have a couple of uh, simulation examples that I wanted to show you before I go away and have the big data stuff done. So what I will do, what I will be doing is a zombie simulation but not this zombie this zombie seriously this zombie so so i'm going to talk about like have you guys got, who watches walking dead yeah. like world war z and stuff like cool huh i'm a big zombie fan so the important thing with a simulation is to have a scenario and have a problem a question that you need to answer so here let's say there's 170 people in a conference room. <laughs> there is one door, and one zombie enters the door. Oh, it would have been cooler if I actually had one of our guys like be a zombie and stuff and walk there, huh? So in any case, but, so in this scenario, how many of us would be zombie food? So that's pretty much the idea of the simulation. So this is how I created the simulation. As you can see, it's fairly simple. And honestly, this is a very simple model. So the important thing with Arena are these, these things. So these things are called modules. And uh, it's pretty much like a drag and drop. What I'll show you is like what each of these modules uh, are, are meant for and what they do. So for example, like this create module, like these things that look like this, they actually create the zombies. They, I mean, the people, the people stampeding out the door. So they create the zombies here, 170, and this one creates like the one zombie going in the door. And this is another important module, which is called the process module. And the process module is actually like a representation of the action. So here, all I really did was like, there's only one action that we will do. It's like a stampede outside the door. So that's pretty much it. So that's uh, one of the process module that we're using. And here, the more, more important stuff in a simulation is actually the decide module. This gives you uh, logic rules, as I mentioned uh, a little while ago. So I made it very simple. So the, the thing here is like, if you were stampeding, what are the chances you get, uh, you encounter a zombie? So if you don't encounter a zombie, then you, the entity actually leaves the simulation. So it's gone. But you, if you do encounter a zombie, the next question, are you zombified or eaten? If you were eaten, then you leave the simulation. But if you get zombified, you actually become a zombie, and it increases the chances that other people would encounter new zombies. So that's pretty much how you do like a simulations. It's very just uh, like creating flow charts. So this one is the record module. As I've said, like Arena, it has like a really cool like statistics and reporting. So this is what a report looks like, and this is a record module. Like if you wanted to want to learn more, just find me like later in the break and stuff, and we can like play around with it. So this is actually what uh, Arena looks like. Okay, so this is Arena. So if you see, it's it looks very much like Visio, right? So these on the on this side are actually the process modules. So it's just drag and drop. It's really that simple. And once you define your your different mod, uh, different modules, your different uh, 
uh, logic rules here, like there. All you really need to do is like tie them together and run it. So think of it as visual that you can actually run and stuff happens. So, so it's uh, pretty cool actually. So, so like here we have our, our zombie simulation. All you need to do is like to run a simulation is actually like a press, press go and it'll run. Oh, wait, it's too fast. But wow, that was fast. So, so, this, so let's do it in slow motion. So you see here it's going like through the different, uh, like the different uh, like uh, logic rules and all that stuff. So, so it's cool to see it. And honestly, there's a lot more prettier, uh, prettier simulations here because you're, the, uh, Arena actually has a visual designer where you can like create very, very fancy stuff. So, but the thing here, the real value of a simulation is not running it once. The real value of a simulation is running it hundreds and maybe thousands of times, right? So you know the best scenario and the worst scenario. So that's why you run it like multiple times. So it's very easy here. So you set, set it up here, you just put like, let's say let's run 100 simulations and let's run it, like now it's in slow motion, but let's put it like a batch run. So I'm going to run 100 simulations here. It's that easy. That's 100 simulations already. So you see the report. So finally, uh, you see the report here. On average, maybe 162 of us would actually get out, on average. Uh, but on a, like a relatively slow day, let's say you guys just had lunch, like really like sleepy, not looking at the stuff, you know, 151 of us could be like zombified or eaten. But you know, if you're all alert, had those monster drinks there. 169 could actually get out, except the speaker here, which is like the one there for raining. So, so anyway, so that was a, like a, a quick example of a simulation. You see, it's really very simple. I, I'd love to give you like the samples here, and you can run it on your own. So the next one, OK, let me, let me. Oh, oops, oops, current slide. OK. So that's the zombie simulation. For my last one, I'm just going to show you something a little bit more practical, but a, a little bit more simple. I think you can actually start with this particular simulation if you're playing around with it. Oh, wait, I forgot a slide. So, well, that zombie thing was a little bit unrealistic, right? So, but the thing here is, think about this. Tweak it, a tweak, uh, tweak it a little, and you can turn the zombies, think of it as malware sites. The people who are stampeding, think of it as users surfing the internet. Think of the zombification process as malware infection. So you can pretty much relate it to information security already, right? So this zombie simulation, uh, that was the point of the zombie simulation. That's really why I did that. So, Questions and decisions. So how much infections are we expecting? Like how many infections could we get in a day, a year, a week, or something, a month? Then how much time do we need to fix this? How much personnel? Maybe I should get some form of malware protection. So all of these could, uh, like this kind of simulation can help you actually make decisions. So going now back to the, to the final, like uh, a simulation that I was going to show you. It's something more simple. It's, it's really simple, this one. You can actually do it yourself. So this one, we're going to talk about the billion dollar lost laptop problem. The important thing with simulations, actually, is aside from the scenario in the question, is the model. So you have to create a good model. So using that, so honestly, I don't actually agree with a lot of the stuff that uh, that paper said, but for now, for the purposes of this example, let's use that. So for that model, they were saying that 2.32 laptops are lost per year, but 4.5% laptops may be recovered. And assume, uh, they say, that 30% uh, of all laptops are actually encrypted. Then they said that the cost of a laptop is actually about $56,000, which is a lot. So if we run this customization, I mean, if we run this simulation using just like maybe a thousand laptops, I won't, sh I, I won't run it. I actually, uh, I'll just show you the results. So you see a 30%, oh, here's the model, by the way. As you see, it's very, very simple, much simpler than the zombie simulation. So with this, 
you can see it's like a 30% encryption. It could actually cost you about 168 to 1.5 million, a lot. Huh? That's why they call it a billion dollar laptop pro problem. So if you like tweak it and with simulations, you can actually tweak it. You can like change it to like 50%. See, it's going down, not by, not by much. And at 75% encryption of the laptop, you'd get like, a, you finally get like a probability of zero, at least at the best best end, but it's still a lot, it's still a lot. But the thing here is that particular simulation that I showed you is, well, unrealistic again. So you have to put it in context when doing like simulations, because uh, not all, oh, because for, for one, not all laptops would have sensitive information, right? And take into consideration the population. So doctors will probably have a higher chance of uh, getting PHI. So in the first simulation, what we did was we assumed that every laptop will cost us $56,000. So in this case, we have the same model, but we do like a little bit more comp, uh, uh, customization. For example, we ask like the, our HR department, hey, how many doctors do we have? And how many do, like uh, people uh, probably like handle sensitive information, like nurses doing admin work and like uh, other like HR personnel and all of that kind of stuff. So that's the value of doing like some customization here. So uh, the rest have no sensitive one. So here, as you, as you can see, we kind of changed a little bit the simulation, right? So we had the original one, but I created a branch here that deals with like doctors and like uh, people handling like PHI and all of that kind of stuff. So if we run, the simulation, you actually get a much lower uh, range. So at 30%, you already have like a pretty good probability, like a best case probability that it won't really cost you. But it's still costing you 50, 75. So it's a little bit lower, much lower. So that's why this is the value of doing a simulation with a customization. But now you're thinking probably, you're probably thinking like, hey, so if we're doing that, so why not just encrypt all the doctors, right? So here, yeah, we do encrypt all the doctors. Let's just encrypt all, uh, encrypt all the doctors, which are 20% of the population. So if you do that, so here's the simulation. I just added like a, another logic rule here, separating the doctors, and you get here, the lowest, right? So this is like a 20% of uh, encryption of the population actually get the lowest uh, value here, zero to 390. So, but now you think about it, right? The results are pretty obvious, pretty obvious. But the thing here gives you quantifiable elements to base and support your decisions. And it is tailored to your environment, which is pretty good. You, it's not just uh, saying to your boss like, hey, on average, uh, laptop loss would probably cost us 6.4 million, so it's, this is much better. So things to remember, I'm wrapping up now the simulation stuff. Simulations can help you find, well, the best solutions for a problem, then the most appropriate to your environment. And you have like quantitative basis for your decisions. But the thing with simulations here, before you do anything, just think about these questions first. Are the results al already known to some of the people in the trenches? So sometimes it is. Sometimes the results are pretty obvious, but sometimes it's not. And sometimes, when, when it gives you like an unexpected result, are you willing to do the change? Are you willing to implement that change based on a simulation? And another thing, the accuracy depends on the model. As you can see, like in my simulations, it's going to the like millions and hundreds of thousands. But that is because I based it off a model like in the paper, the Ponemont paper. So that, those are the things that you have to think about with simulations. And you can do fantastic things with simulations, not only the things that I show you, which look like flowcharts, you can actually do, I skipped another slide. So let me just uh, go back, like uh, some other use cases and scenarios of uh, simulations. For one, I've already seen like some studies that they're actually doing, like uh, simulating hacker activity. So they're simulating like a, like a reconnaissance, they're si simulating enumeration, vulnerability scanning, and exploitation. I've seen like really cool papers about that one. Then they're also doing like uh, simulations of network attacks, and what they're doing there is actually getting like snort attacks and running it, like funneling those snort attacks based on a live snort box and funneling it into like simulations of large networks. 
So seeing like uh, where it's getting caught and all of that kind of stuff. So aside from this, there's a lot more like virus and worm propagation. You've seen that like it's very similar to the zombie simulation. And I would love to talk to you guys about other interesting simulations that you can think of. So I'll be actually outside. And if you guys want to talk about it, if you want to learn uh, how to do this, I'll be there and doing like a, like a teaching kind of thing. So anyway, other stuff that you can do with it, it's not only those flowchart kind of things because uh, simulations in Arena, Arena actually has like what it's called like a visual designer. You can actually make it as pretty as you want to. And as you see here, here's the combat simulation. Here's an emergency room simulation. This one is a truck assembly, and that one's actually a mission to Mars simulation. So you can do as like really pretty ones. So in any case, that pretty much ends my uh, simulation talk, and I uh, would like to turn over this presentation to Mr. Bob McPherson. He's going to talk about big data. Thank you, Ryan. Well, it's good to be back in Waikiki. It's been since 1996 that I was here before, and I uh, always enjoy it when we get a chance to come to Hawaii. I lead a team of researchers that work with catastrophe modeling data uh, for an, a large insurance company, and we run supercomputing environments and lots of data that does simulation models, kind of like what Ryan was showing, but we're simulating hurricanes and earthquakes and terrorism attacks and things like that, um, kind of fun stuff. And some of you might be asking, what does that have to do with security? Well, basically nothing. Um, but uh, I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so you all should be uh, comfortable knowing that. <laughs> no, actually, uh, Ryan and I, we met uh, at a course uh, at the Harvard University last year, and uh, we bumped into each other at a pizza party, believe it or not, and he got peanut butter in my chocolate, and I got chocolate in his peanut butter, and so we thought it tasted pretty good, and, and we ought to try collaborating a little bit and uh, seeing what happens when you take some analytics and you bring it to a different data set. And I just love analytics of all kinds, so I've explored analytics well beyond insurance in a lot of different fields, and it's always fun to get some new data and, and try to explore that and see what you can find out with some various algorithms and analytical techniques. So I re really rely on Ryan's expertise and other experts to ask the right kinds of questions and that sort of thing. And my hope is that when you see some of the examples I'll give, that some of you that maybe already have some expertise in analytics will be saying, gee, you know, I could think of some other questions that could be asked, maybe even some better questions and some other ways to attack it. Other you, others of you will be looking at the code thinking, uh, you know, I have a code allergy. For those of you that remember the uh, Reese's peanut butter cup commercial I just men mentioned with the peanut butter and the chocolate, you're really dating yourselves if you chuckle at that one. <laughs> the younger ones of you, that was a Reese's peanut butter cup commercial, probably don't know what in the world I'm talking about there. Um, so why would you do this? Well, you could do server log forensics. I'm going to show that as an example. But of course, you can analyze lot, lots of different kinds of data beyond server logs. I'm simply going to show that as an example here because it's a little bit easier to grasp, a little bit easier to demonstrate. But you could do it with streaming data. You could also do some text mining analysis on websites and that sort of thing. There's a lot that you can do with this. Also, you'll notice that I've broken just about every rule in giving presentations by putting way too much information in every slide. But that's because I want you to have something you can take home with you. I've been to a lot of conferences myself where, uh, you know, I always appreciated it when I had a presentation I could take home later and study it in a little more depth and give me some code that I could work with as well occasionally. What we're going to show here is, is uh, some big data technology, Hadoop and MapReduce. How many of you have heard of Hadoop by show of hands? Okay, probably about half of you, a fair, fair number of you. And uh, MapReduce kind of goes hand in hand with Hadoop. And I'm going to use something called Hive technology that rides on top of that that enables you to query uh, data, textual data, that's distributed across many different computers. That's what Hadoop will do for you. I'll explain a little more about that later. And we're going to do some fuzzy searches for keywords and terms. We're going to do some time, time aggregations of web log variables, uh, perform sorting to identify potential problem sources. We're also going to create some analytical data sets that can be exported, and you can use other analytical tools on it. So if you've got many servers, they obviously create a lot of logs, and it can be very, very difficult to deal with uh, a scenario where you have a lot of logs that you need to analyze at once. To do them one by one takes way too much time, and maybe even, even be impossible. So what you can do with Hadoop 
in that environment is you can actually analyze them all at once as if they were in one table. It's going to look to you like they're all in one table, but in fact, you've got many different server logs that you're analyzing simultaneously. And the setup that I've got here is you've got the log files, and I'm going to use an Amazon cloud environment. How many of you have heard of Amazon's EC2 environment, Elastic Cloud Compute? Okay, less of you, but some of you have. And you could have also done this in your own environment. You could set up custom, and I've done that uh, as well. But the reason I'm showing Amazon is because every one of you has access to that. They have a free trial, after which uh, there is a nominal charge. Could be a big charge, depending on how many virtual computers you spin up. But uh, I've been doing it for some time on my own, and I haven't had a big bill yet, what I consider to be a big bill. So it's kind of a convenient way to essentially have super, super computing capability at your fingertips. And Hive lets you write SQL-like syntax queries on Hadoop. How many of you know SQL? OK, probably about a third of you know SQL. Um, how many of you know somebody that knows SQL? OK, most of you know somebody, at least, that knows SQL. So if you don't know it, you can turn this over to someone in your staff or somebody in your organization that can, that can work with it. Essentially, I've taken these log files, and I've moved them to an Amazon S3 bucket, which is just storage, simple storage. And from there, I push it into a Hadoop distributed file system, and then I run Hive queries on that file system. So that's essentially the flow of what's going, going, going to happen here. Now, the server logs can be downloaded from this location. So when you go home, if you want to give this a shot, the data is all out there. You can download it from there. I put, put them all there. And the uh, HQL code, which is what Hive calls its query language, it's really just SQL with a few extra capabilities and features thrown in. But if you know SQL, you can do HQL. That code all sits out at this website. And then I'm also going to use a little bit of R. R is a statistical programming language. It's, R is known as the lingua franca of statistics these days. So I've got some code out there, sample that you can work with. The software that you need to run the analysis is all out there in uh, EC2, Amazon. And there's a really nice tutorial here. And I've got some uh, web links to get to it. And I'll just show you what that looks like. It's pretty easy to follow. There you go. And it's got screenshots and that kind of thing to get you started. Now, I won't say it's something you can do in 15 minutes. It is going to take you a little time to learn this. Uh, it, it's not really necessarily a trivial effort, but it's certainly doable for everybody in here if you just want to devote uh, a couple hours to it to kind of learn how to navigate that environment and uh, become operational in it. It's well worth the investment in time, though, I'd say. Also, there's a link here if you want to set up your own environment and you don't want to do it in Amazon. You can use something called Cloudera that's also open source, and you can download that for free to try it out. I've got a link here to R and also a technology called Mout. Looks like Mayhout. They pronounce it Mout. And that enables you to do analytics in a Hadoop and MapReduce environment. So for those of you that don't know SQL, I'm just going to do a real quick high-level introduction as to what it does. It stands for Structured Query Language. Essentially, it follows the same structure every time. If you're going to create tables, it follows a set structure. A common query follows a structure here where you have a select uh, column names, you list the names, and then from, you list the table or tables. Where, and the where is simply a filter, and you just name your categories you're going to filter by and your rules. And then you can group by the categories. You can also order them by the categories. You can do other, th do other things like joins and whatnot. So it may look like Greek today, but if you spend a little bit of time to learn, it's probably the easiest language to learn of any that I can think of. So it's worth a little bit of uh, effort and investment to learn this. Hive uses Java code to make text files look like tables in a relational database. And it's known as NoSQL. It doesn't liter literally mean NoSQL. You can obviously write SQL against it with something like Hive. What it means is not only SQL. So the NoSQL is a bit of a misnomer. And here's the software stack that we're going to use. You have a Hadoop file system that takes these server logs, and it spreads it out. If you can imagine having an uh, Microsoft file, um, you know, your folders and whatnot. You've got your file explorer in Microsoft. Well, imagine your server logs being spread out in a file structure there, but not just on your desktop. 
spread out across many desktops or many servers. That's kind of what it's doing here. It's just decentralizing it and spreading it out. So you have many, many machines, the power of many machines working for you to do the crunching here. So once you have the server logs spread out that way in a Hadoop file system, you need something to be able to aggregate it and do the analysis. And that's where MapReduce comes in. That's the technology that enables you to do that. And then, uh, you, well, you could write Java, because MapReduce is based on a Java platform. For, so for those of you that are Java programmers, just curious on this, show of hands, how many of you have ever prog programmed anything in Java? A uh, few of you have, okay. So you could program in, in uh, Java if you would like, and you can really customize things that way. But I'm showing you Hive on top of, of Java and MapReduce. What that does is it translates your queries in a way that can be run in MapReduce and makes it easier. And SQL is a much more commonly known language, much easier to work with if you're just going to explore the data. So just to give you an example, here, here to set up your environment, here are your commands. You set up first a, uh, uh, your, your distributed file system, and then you move your data from your S3 buckets and you start Hive simply by copying or typing in Hive and you have to add a, a Java archive file that's jar, known as a jar file. And I'm setting here to show the headers as true, so anytime I get output, it's gonna show the headers of the columns. So you, you're obviously not gonna memorize that, but it's there for you. If you wanna go and you wanna copy those, you just paste it right at the command line in Hive, and you can run with it and get started. The log files we're gonna analyze are in combined format, but there are many kinds of formats that, that your log files could take the shape of. So you can customize this any way that you may need to. And we're going to use something called regular expressions to parse the log files. And regular expressions, for those of you that don't know, is just sort of a mini programming language that will parse text. And uh, I'm not sure why they call it regular. It doesn't look very regular when you look at it, but they're called regular expressions. And here's a create table statement that you can simply copy this. You paste it right at the Hive command prompt and it will create the table for you. And here you see those funny squiggly things down toward the bottom. Those are regular expressions. These characters down here, believe it or not, that's actually t giving instructions as to how to parse each of the fields in your log file and telling it what columns to put it in. So all of that's there for your combined format. And I'm using Apache's example logs, uh, not Apache's, I'm sorry, um, Amazon's file logs. They have some that you can actually sample and they're in common format. Um, I added to it though, I put some, I put some uh, attacks in there, some examples of, uh, I put a seventh file in there that shows vulnerable, vulnerabilities that were exploited and they're actual attacks so that we can actually detect some of those. And when you actually load this, here's what the Hive command prompt looks like. Hive at the command prompt, load data in path, and you just paste this in here, and it's going to take and transfer all of those log files that were in my storage, S3 storage, and then move them across. It happens very quickly. Now, the first part of this, what I'm going to show, is the known unknowns. All I'm going to do here is do some direct SQL queries on the log files, and I'm going to look for some specific situations. So we don't know if there are any, any, any intrusions in here into our log file, but we know what we're looking for, and we know what those attack vectors are. So that's probably the simplest situation. So I'm going to show that first. But there are also unknown unknowns, and I'll get to those later. And when you're actually doing an analysis, you might want to start with the unknown unknowns first, just to see where you might want to start your search, and then go to your known unknowns. And it'll become a little more clear, I think, as I go on here. There's an operator in SQL, or SQL, called like. And you could just look for patterns uh, using like. And it's a simple way to do it. If you prefer using regular expressions, and I'm sure some of you are capable of doing that, you can also use regular expressions to really hone in on what you want to do. But the like operator is a little easier to show what we're doing here. So here's an example. I'm going to select all columns, that's what the asterisk means, from the table Apache log, and that's what I called it when I created it. And I'm going to lowercase, so where you see lower, that's simply a function that reduces everything to lowercase, so everything's consistent where it's like any, whenever you see any of these kinds of scenarios. So you got .exe. Obviously, that's somebody that's probably hunting around for an .exe file, uh, possibly doing an inclusion of an .exe file. Um, .ini is another one, executable. Uh, you've also got a lot of files here that are at the root of any kind of a Linux kind of an operating system that I'm sure many of you recognize, USR, ETC, DEV, opt, root, et cetera. So if you find any of those, 
then bring them back and show us. Also, the very last one here is sort of the Swiss Army knife of traversal, the dot dot at the very bottom. Whenever you have dot dot slash, those of you know little Unix know that you can bump up to the next uh, folder above or the next uh, directory using that dot dot. And you see that a lot with these kinds of attacks. And here's the result when you, when you run that query right at the Hive command prompt. There, in fact, were, these were actual attacks. Some instances that came back, and you see the ubiquitous dot, dot, dash, dot, dot, slash, but you also look at the status code here, and it's a 404. Okay, that, was a, that failed. That's a, that's a, a status code that, that really, it was a request that failed. 500 series would be another one that failed. Until you get down here at the bottom one, that's a 200 down there. That one succeeded. That one actually got through. A lot of these are just trial and error until they actually manage to get through. So you can just do this from any direction and query anything you want. That's the advantage of doing these custom queries. And yeah, okay, it's a lot of code, takes a little bit of effort, but again, uh, this will do whatever you dream up. You're not gonna get that with any kind of a GUI or fancy kind of a, an application. There's command injections. What this will do is try to disguise commands with HTML URL encoding. This query is a very simple one, but it includes keywords from some common examples like uh, ampersand comma, or 20, percent 20 echo, percent 60 ID. And you can, you can really add to this list. There are a lot of other possibilities that you could do. But just using these few, reduce to these here, these, uh, uh, these problems that came through where there were actual breaches here. And you, if you look through, you can actually see that there are examples of the ampersand comma and some of those uh, key terms that we looked for earlier. So those are the known uh, examples of known unknowns, and I actually have a lot, uh, I've done a lot more, and I've got a few more examples in the sample code you'd be able to download if you want to take a look at that. Uh, but that's all I'm going to show at this point, just to give you the idea of what I mean by sort of a free form query or free form search. Now let's go to the unknown unknowns. This is a little trickier. This is where you get into some of the zero day stuff and that sort of thing. Here you're going to be looking for outliers. You're going to need to use some statistics in this one. So I realize it probably just went from bad to worse. You just went from code. Now you're going to statistics. But uh, for those of you that enjoy that kind of thing, and I can see there's some of you that do, just by show of hands, um, you probably enjoy doing some of this stuff in big data, and maybe some of you do already. By the way, if you do, feel free to send me a note. If you have ideas or whatever, uh, I'm always loving to collaborate and learn from others. So send me, send me whatever you've got. It's fun stuff. Um, let's move on here. Here we talk about, we're going to kind of peg this analysis on the status codes. The 100, 200, 300 series range all have one thing in common, and that's basically that it was a success of some kind or other. You have comments to go with it, but basically those were successful requests to the server. But if you get in the 400 range and the 500 range, those were unsuccessful attempts. The 500 range you really need to watch out for because those are the ones where the server itself, there was a failure uh, on the server side of it. A series of failed requests could be an indication of a, an attacker using trial and error until the attack succeeds. So what if you could look for some patterns of that where they're actually doing some trial and error? You don't know what attack vector they're doing. You don't know what queries to run necessarily. You don't know how they're coming in on it. But you want to see if they're maybe doing some trial and error followed by some successes. So we're going to try out some, some methods of doing that. First, we're going to group it by those types the 100, 200, 300 series as a success. We're gonna code those as a zero, those are your successes. And the 400, 500 series, we're gonna code as a one. So that you can actually run some statistics and predict whether you're gonna get a zero or gonna get a one or that kind of thing. So we have a case statement in here. And I'm using a substring function. So hi, for those of you that know SQL, you're used to the substring type of an approach or function. You can also do that with Hive pretty directly as you can see here. And I can also do time aggregations. So I can take that date stamp in the log file, and I can actually aggregate by time using SQL queries or HQL queries, and I can parse it. Most of you already know, I think, what a timestamp looks like. But here I've got in the third bullet an example. You've got 20th of July, 2009, and then I've got the time. And you can parse it down to the second if you want to, if you want to look at what happens throughout a particular day. In this case, I'm just going to parse it down to the month and the day and the year so that I can get a time series. And here's an example of the query. Now in my code, it looks a lot prettier than this, but this is about the only way I could cram it into a slide. You could actually copy this from here and run it. Um, and the result of this query is down at the bottom where I've got month and year. Now, 
it doesn't quite line up. When, when you get the output, the, the seven, which is the month, doesn't quite line up with the, the column header month, as you can see, but you can figure it out. This is just how it prints out. The year is 2009, and then the combination month day is 0720, so that's July 20th, and the year month is 20907. Now, I added some views to that to, to further get my day in here, and I'm gonna also, I'm, I'm gonna create some views that just look for failed requests. So in this case, um, I'm gonna do a daily time series and look for trend sequences, and ultimately I'm gonna get, from running the query below, I'm gonna get something that looks like this up here where it says 2009-07-20. And I'm also gonna do two different views. Now a view is like creating a table, but it really what happens is that your code is stored, your SQL code is stored, and when you run a view, it's gonna run that query again live. And that's what I've done here. I've created two views. One looks for successful attempts, another looks at failed attempts. And if I take a ratio between the two, I'm gonna get a daily ratio of failed to successful attempts over time. So what I'm gonna look for is spikes where I have a lot of failed requests followed by successes and see if I can do some outlier detection on that. Anyway, when I run these views, I get something that looks like a bot at, at the bottom here where you've got a column that says year, month, day, it's 2009, July 7, 20, and then you get a fail ratio there on the right. And I can export that data for further analysis. And I just run this here, this little request that says insert overwrite local directory and then I put a name there as to what I wanna call it. And it's gonna create a folder by this name failed request by day and it's gonna dump the data in there. From there you can pull it into data visualization tools like Tableau um, or you can uh, run R and do your own uh, homegrown visualizations if you will and that's kinda of what I'm gonna show here. And here's some R code. I'm not gonna teach you all to be R programmers, but the code's here and you can run it if, uh, if you wanna try this at home. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna create a plot that shows outliers. And this is across time. You see day in the bottom and the x-axis. And the y-axis is the ratio of failed requests to successful requests. And for any of you that have ever had Six Sigma training or anything like that. How many of you ever heard of Six Sigma? Yeah, it's, it's an operations research term. And uh, you're probably familiar with the upper control limit, lower control limit concept. Well, it's a simple way that you can do that, and R will do that pretty readily. And I just, the dotted line at the very top there is two standard deviations from the mean. And a standard deviation, the easiest way I know how to describe that is essentially what is your average deviation from the mean? So what is your average difference from the average, essentially, is, is all that is. And so if, if you look at the days where you're well above two times the average difference from the average, you've got three incidents here that look rather odd. And I think this is kind of interesting because this was mostly Amazon server logs. I didn't put enough uh, error situations in here or penetration situations in here to really have spiked it that much. So it looks to me like somebody probably was making some attempts against Amazon's logs and uh, was not successful, but nevertheless, they made an attempt. And if you find a situation like this, might bear looking into those particular days and drilling down. And if you saw in the previous example here, I actually, this fail ratio, you can go down through and you can find those particular days. You can actually do a max function, so you look for the maximum days and you can find it there pretty readily. You can drill down into those. I also was looking for seasonality because anytime you're dealing with a time series, you need to know, is there any seasonality that could have screwed that up, you know, your findings? And in this case, I ran an autocorrelation function and basically there's no evidence here of any significant seasonality that I should be concerned about. But if, if there was, you can adjust that for seasonality. In this case, that tall line that goes, the first line at the left that goes above the dotted line that just is at the zero point. So that's telling me that the, core, that the time series is not correlated to itself, hence the term autocorrelation. And if you had seasonality, it would be correlated to itself at some point in here. And so I'm not seeing any evidence of that. But R will do all those kinds of things and much, much more. And I can also uh, produce additional analytical data sets and I'm gonna group this one a little bit differently and I'm gonna use something called Mount, which enables you to do analytics on Hadoop and MapReduce without pulling data into something like R, because R is limited. R has limited memory 
it, well, it uses a lot of memory in your system, actually. So, you know, you have to aggregate your data up to a small enough data set. And if you're aggregating it into a time series, well, that does shrink your data size quite a bit. So you're able to pull that out and analyze it as I just did, even though the amount of data in those server logs was, was way too big to just pull directly into my R environment without aggregating it uh, by time. In this case, these are command line uh, command, uh, command lines that you can put into the mount environment and it'll run a map reduce job for you and it'll do something called a logistic regression. And all it does is it predicts whether you're gonna have a one or a zero. Remember one from that earlier query that I did means that you had some kind of a penetration, some kind of a problem there. A zero means it was okay. So we're just gonna predict that and all we're gonna use as a predictor in this case, I didn't make it fancy, I just wanted to do it by host. Are there any hosts, in other words, that are associated with uh, failed requests or hosts that tend to be associated with successful requests? And that's all this is doing here. Um, so I ran it and I disguised some of the IP addresses here because it was actual data. Um, so I've got X's there at the beginning. But uh, this is how you would set up the problem. And in the end, what you get is, is a coefficient for each one of those hosts and, it, and the size of that number tells you how related it is to either failed requests or successful requests. And on the left-hand side, the way I set this up, this problem, the negative numbers are successful requests. So all of the hosts on the left-hand side tend to be more associated with successful requests. And I sorted it by that coefficient. And so you see that most hosts actually do have successful requests, as we would expect, but I'd be more concerned with the ones over here on the right and I don't see any huge spikes because, again, we're using Amazon's data. I would hope there wouldn't be any huge spikes there. But if you, if you had a very vulnerable situation, I would expect to see a much bigger spike here on the right-hand side where there are certain IPs that are associated, tend to be associated with failed requests. And those might bear some further investigation. In other words, they tend to have more failed requests than they have successful requests. So something that could be interesting to drill down into. Now I'm going to do some time series ana analysis uh, cor cross correlations. And here I'm going to be exporting the series data from Hive to be imported into R again. And I'm going to run correlations with different lags to search for possible leading or lagging effects between the status codes. And here what I'm, I'm going to try to look for is trial and error attacks. So what you might have is a series of failed uh, requests followed by successful requests where they managed to get in. So they were trying a lot of different things, failed, and then suddenly got in. And so here I'm going to create a view. This is all done in Hive. And I'm summing everything up by the status code. And I'm also putting some descriptive names to each status code. 101, switching protocols, 102, processing, et cetera. There's another one. Uh, there's a status code in here, I'm a teapot. Have any of you ever seen that one? Yeah, OK. That was an April Fool's joke, actually, that uh, there really is a status code. It's an Ap Apache April Fool's joke that says, I'm a teapot. And another one says, stay calm, the one that follows that. So <laughs> geek humor, what, what can I say? Cross-correlation analysis, if you, if you continue to run it and pull it into R, here I have a read table command that actually pulls the data that I exported from the previous data set, or previous code into status frequencies, an object or a variable. Now I can analyze it. And I'm also going to copy the headers from Hive, the descriptive headers, put those in R as well, the and I'm going to make those, those column names. And here's some more code where I'm actually running some analysis on the result. And let me show you the result. This is a cross-correlation analysis where it's a scatter plot. So you've got an array of scatter plots. And what I'm looking for is any kind of a diagonal line that looks like it's shaping up to be a pretty good diagonal sort of a pattern. That means that there's a relationship between two of these variables. And the strongest one happens to be this one here on the bottom left. It's fairly diagonal, as you can see. And this is the 200 code, or OK. And if I go across to the right, related to the method not allowed code over here. So here you've got some method not allowed failures that cr strongly correlate to successes 200 OK. I'd probably, it doesn't prove that there was a problem here, but it's something I'd probably want to look at a little bit more closely. And then here you can look at it numerically, the same thing. So here I've got 200 OK, and the cor correlation coefficient is 0.94 with method not allowed, 405. That's a pretty strong correlation. A 1.0 would be a perfect correlation, and the only thing it would be 1.0 is 200 
uh, correlated to itself here. That is a 1.0. Uh, but of the failed codes, method not allowed is, is the strongest one. And now I wanted to do a cross-correlation analysis to see if there's any lag time. So in other words, do, does this effect tend to occur the same day? And are they running these method not allowed uh, codes and then getting in with a success code on the same day? If they are, then that might be an indication that indeed there is something going on here. Somebody's fishing around. And in fact, you see here in the zero, in the center of this plot, the tallest line here that's significant. And yes, uh, indeed, uh, it tends to be that on the same day, you're getting success codes that are, that are strongly correlated with the method not allowed 405 code. And a few days later, you get this negative correlation. Um, could be an aberration. That one doesn't look quite as statistically significant. But it would also stand to reason that if they did manage to go in and they tried to get back in four days later, that you would see a decrease in the 405 codes. They don't need to be trying a lot of things. They already know how to get in. So in conclusion, all I'm trying to do here is show you some examples of what you might do with some code fairly simply, fairly quickly, to look at this from a lot of different dimensions. And with all the creative minds here, I'm sure you guys can think of much more intelligent things to do with it than I did, especially with your background in security. So I would encourage you that it's worth the effort, uh, as was pointed out earlier, to learn a little bit of coding and really do things that you're not going to be able to do with any other fancy GUI-driven or graphical-driven tool. So with that, that's my challenge to you, and I hope you take it away. And if you find some neat things, send me a note and let me know. Thank you.